is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Immortal Great Souls Book One, Bastion, chapters 9, 10, and 11. In these chapters, I'm going to be honest, I never thought that we were going to have Scorio getting out of this, like, underground as quickly as he does. I really am glad that things are progressing so quickly. This has got me very interested. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Dan for commissioning this episode. Dan is here in the chat. Thank you so much, Dan. Appreciate you a lot. Um, and remind me, how many books are in, are in this series? And is the series finished being written yet? Or is the author still working on this one? I, uh, I intended to ask this like every episode and I keep forgetting. So these chapters are, like I said, kind of an unexpected jump forward. I really thought that we were going to have an, like, you know, we had three chapters of, uh, of like the progress of him getting thrown into the underworld. And I'm calling it the underworld because that's just how it feels to me. And I just thought we would have three chapters of him finding his way out and that there would be like, we, we would break the surface at the end of the third of these three chapters and he would look outside and that would be how this little section ended. And I'm really glad to be wrong about that. I just always appreciate when a story moves a little faster than I think it's going to move. So Dan says there are three books. Now the fourth is end of the year and still coming out. Is that, how like how many does he intend to write? Has he said? Although I know that that doesn't necessarily mean anything because authors can be like, oh, there's only one more book. And then before you know it, you've got like another whole trilogy on your hands or just stares at camera in George R. R. Martin or Brandon Sanderson or, you know, a lot of things. <laughs> um, I don't think he said I would guess six-ish. Okay, cool. So let's, uh, let's start at the beginning here. Scorio is fleeing from this fiend. Um, and he is running like, this is the thing that I find sort of fascinating with him is the fact that he has had like very little rest, food, hydration. Um, he got a little bit of a respite with these people, but he was like literally recovering from a really bad Infection, poisoning, I'm not really sure which one it is. I think it's it was a poisoning um, because the poison was what was used to heal him. So, like, not exactly the most restful of time. And the fact that he is just constantly being expected to perform physically and he's managing to do it. I don't know if this is just a manifestation of like, you know, main character syndrome where they're always able to keep going. If this is supposed to be kind of a hint that his like abilities are above and beyond most people's and that if he weren't who he is, the author would be writing him being a lot more exhausted. He is, you know, by the time he gets above ground and everything, it's not like he isn't exhausted and starving, but there's just there's a feel to him for a lot of this of being surprisingly okay. So he's just sprinting here. Um, a huge claw swiped through the air above him, the talons trailing purple flame, which I'm sorry, that's dope. That's just cool. I love the fact that it's got like fire claws. Um, so this is when he gets to like a spot where he has to really wedge himself in. And I was sort of gratified after the thing that I said last time about the manga and like shoving yourself into a crack and just seeing what happens. 
that we sort of get that here, even though it's for the for a different reason. It's not to explore, it's to escape. But you know, we reached the same point anyway, so that's fine. And uh, it made a huge impression on me that these fire claws are actually clawing grooves into the rock. That's just that's just another level, you know. Like it's one thing to have a claw, but most claws they're not going to have much of an impression on stone. And these, I mean, yikes. <laughs> um, and it's trying to get at him and he is just barely out of reach. And I love this. For a moment, the beast simply stood there, contemplative. I don't know why, but that got me laughing so hard. Scorio waited for a roar of fury, but none came. Instead, it tapped its claws upon the rocks, the sound rhythmic, then withdrew its arm. It stood outside the crack for a spell, studying him with one baleful eye. And then it turned and was gone. A trick? Definitely. So he remained still, waiting, watching the crack. The darkness beyond that his moss lamp failed to illuminate. So he waits and waits and waits, and he's just so certain that it's a trick. And once he actually gets out of this crack, he's looking around and like thinking the fiend is hiding, that it's right there. And it isn't. And this was just fascinating to me because I really thought that we were going to see this thing have like made a den somewhere close by that he would run across it again. And it seems like it just went, like, it, it It just got bored, you know, pretty quickly. And I just, there's something that really interests me about that and the way that these creatures work and the fact that they don't seem, well, they're, they're clearly not normal. But he runs into a lot on the way up to the surface here. And I'm not, because I want to focus more on the characters that we meet later and what happens with them in the dialogue, I am not going to spend too much time on this. But I did want to mention just the the overview of who it is that he comes across. So first, he comes across this like swarm of insects in the dark, all like the size of a dog, like a small dog. I'm going to say probably maybe like a terrier let's say like a terrier i really hate bugs you guys i don't i don't know how much i've talked about this before so i'm gonna just like do this for a minute but i feel i need to make it very clear there are a few things that really frighten me there are a few things that i'm really deeply uncomfortable with that will get me you know like some things you know it's meant to be horrible. And while you can objectively see that, yes, it is horrible, and in person I would probably be horrified, you don't have that like visceral reaction to it. But I do have that with insects. It's just too fucking much for me. I, I, and this is a problem as somebody who is trying to get into gardening also, that like, I know that's a fucking handicap. I'm gonna have to get okay with bugs. I, I, I'm, I'm going to try, but this is like the fastest way to make me just kind of lose my lunch. It's between things with insects and things with like medical torture. I can't with those two things. They're like top of my list for absolutely not, you know? So anyway, oh God, you guys, I'm sorry. These things, they begin to just like fall on him. And there was something about the fact that they are falling from the ceiling that also felt really unfair. I, it, it, it just, that's kind of how bugs can work. You know, like they are on the ceilings of caves and stuff. It's too real with bugs that are too big. And they fucking just claw the shit out of him. Like he heals from this and it doesn't seem that they were poisonous, but there is definitely a bit here where I was just like, Oh God, like, Oh, so he is like trying to get away with it from them. And he just winds up falling. There's like a vertical drop. Um, 
And he he falls and he like looks around and realizes there are stalagmites around him and that if his fall had been a slight bit off to the left or right, he would have been impaled, which uh, that is a sobering moment. Anytime that you have like a close call, it really has you kind of questioning fate and luck and just reevaluating your choices. Um So this is when he finds this corpse and uh, it says it was impossible to tell much about the corpse. The scalp showed wisps of dark hair. The eyes were gone. The lips pulled away to reveal yellowed teeth. A moldy leather belt was wrapped around its waist with an empty dagger scabbard at the hip. Scorio raised his fist full of moss light higher. A dagger lay amidst the remains of the skeletal hand and I was talking in the, in the first episode about how it felt very video gamey and like running from creatures and then coming across a corpse that you can loot. This is super video gamey. I don't have an inherent problem with that, but there, I, I just feel like it is so direct, like a one to one that I, I kind of wish this didn't f- like make me think of that so immediately, but there's also like a difficulty with when you are writing a video game, you're also writing a story. So how do you just get away from tropes altogether? I guess you can't, but you get what I'm saying. Um, So there's a bunch of stuff in there that is absolutely useless. The food is disgusting. The rope is rotted through. There's a blanket that's like, uh, it's, he's, it says tightly rolled. And I was sort of like, maybe that's going to be okay. The tinderbox is rusted. And then this is wild. Scorio froze at the sight of the miniature bridge. It was about six inches long, gently arched, and untouched by decay. Cunningly wrought, it lay on lightly on his palm, innocuous and plain. And he goes back to this uh, this corpse, and it says he drew out a steel rod some eight inches wide and snug enough to fit in his hand. Turning over and over, he found that it was inscribed with flowing runes, but nothing that he could understand or read. Finally, he drew out a thick roll of oiled cloth, within which was a stick of chalk the size of his thumb. Curious, hesitant, he leaned down and drew a slender line across the ground. The air above it immediately shimmered and undulated like haze caused by baking heat. Scorio extended his palm and pressed forward only to be met with a cool and utterly solid form of resistance. And this is interesting, the fact that this works without him really seeming to have to tap into anything. It's like the object itself is enchanted and would work for anybody. And it may not It may only work for people who at least have like the qualifications that he does, but I, it it feels for me based on the way it's written that he isn't having to invest any energy particularly, and it's still doing its thing. Um, And, you know, there's a part of me also that sort of wonders at the fact that he used it to draw a line right away, sort of with this feeling of knowing that like, this does something significant. If I came across a pack and I saw that there was a piece of chalk in it, granted, I don't live in a world with magic. So like, that's going to change everything. But I don't think that I would immediately use it, just draw a line on the ground. I feel like I would just be like, oh, chalk. huh? Because that does kind of feel like a supply that you might have in caves like this, like to just mark where you have already circled through and warn yourself if you're going in circles, that sort of thing. Um, So I was sort of wondering if there was a feel to it, but it's not described that he, that he gets a sense off of it. So maybe not. It's just a coincidence. Um, He wrapped the chalk up in its oiled cloth and took hold of the steel rod. Havert had said it would remain locked in place once activated, but he saw no means of doing so. Was the script perhaps an incantation? And, when he says Haver had said it would remain locked in place once activated, is this supposed to be the guy that came and was like the magic man with his magical toys and whatnot? Because the, like I had a moment of confusion here and thinking like Haver was the corpse 
And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. So, okay. Dan is saying, yes, it is. I feel like the, the, the way that this is written for it to suddenly be like Haver had said. And I, guess that like if I was reading this closer together to those chapters that they describe the exact items that this guy had in his bag do they do that forgive me for not remembering but I know that they sit around and they talk about like some of the stuff that he had and uh the one girl says something like I don't even care if he's real I just like being able to talk about him because it makes me feel better so okay Dan says they do talk about the items so that is how he knew how to draw this piece of chalk on the ground and immediately tried it out that makes sense okay good 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 um so he takes the miniature bridge first and is just like what do, how do I do this and he's kind of getting frustrated because he's thinking that something is going to just come to him. And at first it just feels like he's stuck with these things that have all of this potential, but he can't actually access. And then he stops and thinks about the igneous heart and the, you know, fact that they can be ignited. And uh, he's thinking about way back, Leon, she's saying, that feels like a current of air passing around us. And he's like, okay, that feels like something. And what he does is that sort of thing where you let your eyes go out of focus so that something becomes clear in a different way and stops trying to feel that, that current, which causes him to feel that current, which is a weird thing, but we all know what that's like and how that works. Um, the act caused his heart or his spiritual core, his very sense of self to ache painfully. Whatever Praximar had done to him, it had wounded him deeply in ways he couldn't yet understand. And this kept having me feeling because like what had happened initially with Praximar, I had thought was Praximar actually like taking his heart out of him. And it wasn't until the conversation that he has later when he's in the caves that I realized that he still had it and that he, it, it just like feels almost like it's been depowered, but it still exists. And I was sort of relieved because having it just taken from you felt pretty fucking harsh. But what this is reminding me of as well is in the Cradle series, there is uh, the ability for people who are much higher up in power levels to shatter the core of other people. And the core is basically like a reservoir of power. And if you shatter it, it basically means that you can never use your abilities again. Or if you can, it's so much lower a power level than you were able to do that. It's like, you know, it's like being going from being able to paint beautifully to then only being able to paint with your toes and having to like figure out how to live with this entirely different skill. Um, so that is like sort of what I'm thinking here is I don't know if this is something that can repair itself over time. If it's something that he has to find somebody to repair for him, if it's something that he can, it, it won't just repair itself, but he can urge it along so that it does like physical therapy, basically. Or if this is the sort of thing where um, this man only just took power, like, you know, it was a, a battery at like a 40% level. This guy stole 38%. And so technically the battery is not empty, but it's fucking nearly there and he has to power it back up. Um, there is a mention later on when we're at that bar, sort of the double, where he says that there's like an easier access somehow to the power when he's out amongst people and it may be because of the people it may be because of like how the city is built it may be because going into these caves like it, there's less of it or the animals take it up you know like there's a lot that could be happening here but i thought it was really interesting and i'm curious about how that works um so he tried to sink deeper into a state of relaxation hands held hands still held before him 
He sank into his trance, mind drifting. A prickle played across his palm, and his eyelids fluttered. fluttered, fluttered. He fought back the surge of excitement and tried to focus on that sensation. A prickle? Not quite. More like a rough cloth being rubbed against his skin. Which I felt like didn't sound awesome. But it's not like it's painful. I just was sort of like, you know, I'm used to magic being described as like this blissful thing. And that was just a lot more texture than I'm used to hearing. Um, so he keeps holding this out and focusing on his heart. And then gradually it appeared once more. This time he thought it required a little less effort. He held it in its mind, in his mind's eye with it present and sought once more to sense that invisible breeze. And this time, hovering in that dark space, he felt it quite easily, like a cloud, amorphous all around him, hovering in the air, ambient, but responsive as well. His focus seemed to stir it to life, as if by concentrating, he became some manner of vortex. And this is when he is it like trying to grasp it. And it's like, basically as described like fog, um, Scorio let out a gasp and opened his eyes. Um, he feels like he's making progress, but it hasn't, it's not like he just magically was suddenly able to tap into something and everything is working. Uh, so he goes back to the corpse, unscrews the cap and takes a sip. Oh, God, that's right. He says Radert's corpse, but I completely misread that. Now I'm realizing because Radert was the guy, uh, what was, what was the name of the other guy? Habert? Habert? I think that I read Radert and was like, that's, I'm misremembering the name of the other dude. Havert, says Dan. Okay, that explains why this was fucking me up. Because I was reading it and feeling like I had missed something. And it's because I got Havert's name, like, I read Ratter and was like, oh, I just, I, I, I thought the name started with an H, but I must be remembering wrong. And I immediately just mistrusted my own instinct and thought that this was one of the guys that he had been sharing that space with, which doesn't make any sense. Cause that dude died before he got out here, but that's part of why I was getting confused. Okay. 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 Got it. Got it. Got it. Um, so let's see. He, he keeps trying this thing. The fog gets more condensed and, uh, he's trying so hard not to let himself get absolutely flipped out, frustrated because he's so, close to feeling like something is happening. He's getting the fog like into this core in his body. I say in his body, but it's like a metaphysical body. Um, and it's just like, clearly I'm right there. I'm almost there. Why can't I get this to work? And he visualized the bar, saw in his mind's eye the swirling script, imagined it a glass into which he was pouring water, a receptacle for the fog, felt the faintest breath of it enter the rod, sink it to, into its essence, and there bind, conjoin? The black energy melded with the rod's fabric. Scorio felt the enigmatic script blaze to life and a portion of the sooty cloud simply burned away and was consumed. And he's like, oh shit. And he goes to fist pump and I love it. He doesn't like think about the fact that what he's doing is enabling this rod that when you empower it, stays in place and cannot be moved. So he like goes to fist pump and his hand won't move because the, the rod is like stuck to his thigh. And he's just like, oh my God, it's worked. And he is freaking out, which I mean, whomst among us would not, I would be so excited. And uh, the thing is, he's able to activate it. But now that it's stuck in place, he's like, well, wait, how do, 
how do I deactivate it? What if I just activated it and now it's like stuck here and I'm just going to have to leave and leave it here? And I was just heartbroken. Look, this is something that's like a, a particular sore point for me. And it's part of why I really enjoyed the Cradle books because Lyndon is also this way and he's the main character. I have a real hard time with like cool tools that wind up getting broken or lost or damaged in, in some way. It's such a bummer for me. And it makes sense because like in real life, I love my things. I can be very materialistic. And I'm just going to own that. You know, I like pretty things. I like useful, practical things and tools and, and items can be so helpful, especially like in a game as well. So the mere thought of like coming across something this dope and then just not knowing how to use it and you do something that fucks it up and you have to leave it just I knew that it wasn't going to happen. I know this character is going to be able to take this with him. Of course he is. Why would he find it? And then just not like that would, that would suck. But just the thought of it, I was just immediately like, Oh God, Oh no, you can't just leave it. And then a second later, the light in the script on the bar fades away and it just drops. And he's sort of wondering at this point, first grateful, but also immediately what causes it to stop? Did I empower it? And it has only so much like battery. I'm going to keep using that word to it that it burns through. And then once it has, then it drops. Or is it like my focus drifting and that causing it? Um, and again, is doing this, this like re of activating it. And it's, I won't say it's like getting easy. It's not easy ever. It takes enough time to do that. It's specifically mentioned later. He can't use this in combat. Like that ability is still not, it's not at all second nature. It is instinctual, but instinctual in a way that's sort of like, I can feel the impulse, but not the action if that makes sense. So, uh, he, he then decides that he's going to play with the bridge. And this one I thought was so wild. He can just about like sense this bridge with his magic. I'm going to call it that, uh, eyes clenched tight. He crawled toward the bridge. The heart slipped from his focus, but he brought it back through sheer determination and reached out to the bridge, fumbling across the damp stone till he touched it. There, the sense of its being a funnel became distinct. Drawing on the clouds once more, he channeled their darkness down and into the tiny bridge, seeking to fill it to the brim. At first, nothing happened, but then the treasure must have passed a threshold because it blazed in his, in his mind's eye. He felt it jerk beneath his hand, crashing outward and jolting upward. And he falls back and sees a 10 yard long timber bridge, which is just the coolest. It's just such a fucking cool tool. Now, I'm going to admit I am not really like much of a gamer girl. I have played, I have played Skyrim. I have played uh, Breath of the Wild. I have played Animal Crossing, and those are pretty much it in terms of like my adulthood and what I remember. I don't recall this kind of tool showing up, and that's not to say that this doesn't exist. But I was wondering about other people who do play games. And if this is something that you have run across in games or not, because the idea of like a chalk that just draws a shield, it feels like something that would be difficult to implement in a game. Not impossible, of course, at all, but just, I don't know, not have the, the sort of, um, I guess maybe I'm imagining it as being like you actually watch the animation of somebody drawing the circle, which isn't necessarily how it would work in a game. It may just be in your inventory and you click it and a shield pops up around you. But like, that's not really the same thing, is it? So the idea also of like this sort of bridge, there's so many points in Breath of the Wild where that would have been great. 
you have the option to glide, but that's not really the same either. And I was just like, oh, this would come in so useful in, in like the couple of games I play, even Animal Crossing, for God's sake. Um, Dan said, says these tools were so weird. Nothing one to one I've ever seen in games, but the tools are video gamey for sure. And I know I complained about the video gamey of like looting this corpse, but because now I've realized who it's supposed to be and that he was mentioned already, it feels less so. And also the fact that like that has been already explained, like even what he had on him, I'm just inclined to treat this differently, even though it doesn't technically change the context of everything so much. It, it just gives it a bit more of a purposeful feel instead of it just being like, oh, there just happens to be this corpse with amazing tools. Like, that's a pretty nice way to give us a heads up, you know? So I'm going to give him some credit on that and take back my earlier criticism of that. Um, So, uh, of course, this whole thing, like, he's looking at this bridge going, okay, uh... I could just step out onto this bridge, but that sounds insane. So let me, let me, you know, figure out how I'm going to approach this. And it's like the whole usage of this, you guys, I couldn't, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Dan is in the chat saying, um, and it answered a question. What happened to that guy with the artifacts? Of course, the artifacts raise a bunch more questions. Yeah. And there's a, a mention of, well, I'll, I'll get to that when I get to it. Um, just as quickly as it had formed, the bridge shrank, sinking to where its far end touched the rocky ground, losing itself in the shadows. And there was a moment, you guys, where I know that this wasn't actually like over a chasm yet, but there was a moment where I forgot that and thought if it shrank, it would just drop down into it. And I'm sure because of the nature of what it is that it's meant to be used with chasms that it doesn't do that but it was definitely a moment of oh god where to go because again i get very attached to my things um so all of this is getting him like so excited and the fact that he is learning how to like manipulate what i'm gonna kind of call ether until told otherwise um it's just really given him a boost which it would you know, but when he wakes up, he is like not doing super well physically. His leg is like fucked up and not wanting to take his weight. Uh, and it says the lamp moss was now at half its previous radiance, limiting his sphere of vision to six or so yards before him. And even that was a ghostly half light. Not ideal. You could say that. Yeah, that's fucking awful. Um, he leaves the body behind and it's just sort of like, that doesn't feel cool, but what option does he have really? And I can't help but think like, you could, you didn't, couldn't bury it obviously, but you could do something, say something at the same time. It feels like disingenuous and weird if that, if you don't know this person and you're, you know what I mean? Like, so it's fine. Um, so he's climbing and it's he stirs the clouds around him and down into the treasures uh treasure it filled and then jerked to life snapping open his eyes scorio saw the bridge erupt upwards the effect almost immediate its far end disappearing into the darkness he gave it a push speeding its fall and dropped down to bounce against the ledge with only five or so seconds remaining he had no time to waste he scampered up the planks as quickly as he could gritting his teeth against the pain in his leg and this lasts five seconds, and I just really, really like the fact that there is this time limit on it. If it just turned into a bridge, and you could fucking chill on this bridge and put up a tent and just, like, live there, that would feel a little bit OP. So the fact that, you know, maybe it's something that he could use in that way once he gets more powerful. But the fact that right now, there's, like, get across that shit, go, go, go. I like it. I like that a lot. Um, I love too, as he's going through the description of how, like, the fact that the fiends aren't all over the place 
makes it almost worse that like he gets himself lulled into kind of a rhythm of walking and forgetting and that the dangers are even there. And then something comes out of nowhere. And there's like almost a sense of the longer it takes to run into anything, the worse it's going to be when I do. And uh, there was something about that that felt video gamey as well, but in a way that I thought was funny. Um, so the ch- chalk proved to be his greatest defense, though he was increasingly loath to use it, which, yeah, that's a, that's a finite resource. So that sucks. Um, his lantern moss had nearly grown completely dark when he turned a corner and awoke a sleeping carpet of mushrooms that began to glow brightly, their gills emitting a green noxious light and which then released a cloud of spores into the air that began to float in his direction. And that there's something about the like quiet danger of that. That's much more unnerving even to me than a monster just trying to attack you. The sinister like subtlety. Oof. Creepy, 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 creepy. Um, so he experimented with different techniques after realizing closing off an entire tunnel was unnecessary. Thus, when he ran into a boulder sized toad, which sat in the center of a cavern, its smooth eyeless sockets shadowed under peaked horns. He simply backed away. But when the toad began to shorten the ground between them, somehow compressing the distance. So Scorio felt as if he were falling toward the fiend. He simply drew a two inch wide line on the ground. This invisible pole smashed into the toad's face, shattering its jaw and knocking it off its perch. And I really love the inventiveness of that. You don't need a wall. You just need an obstacle. And that could be something like perhaps even a dot you could be like a, it could be wire thin maybe. And that would be enough to just slice somebody down the middle. So all of that, I just thought was a really like neat exploration of the different ways that you could use something like this. Um, He'd used a quarter of it, escaping five different monsters, each distinct from the last. At the rate he was going, he guessed the chalk would last him another 15 or so moderate applications, and then it would be gone forever devastating i'm devastated like it makes sense to have there be something that's a finite resource but i just want it to be everlasting as well you know i say that i don't know that the bridge and the bar are everlasting but i really think they are they seem like something it's like until they get literally broken in half they're gonna work um so he manages to make himself keep going to the point that eventually he gets to this like light uh, that's a a crack up into the ceiling. And he's thinking that maybe it's going to lead back to the gauntlet. Um, And it it was interesting to think about like the gauntlet being an actual place that you can get to, because I don't know why I was imagining the gauntlet as a sort of like three dimensional ether space. I don't know how else to say this. Like, What I was thinking was that you basically like get your mind uploaded into a game and that's part of how they're able to observe who gets how far. It's like you are mentally there and your personality and your abilities are the same as they would be in real life, but that you aren't actually in a physical place that can be gotten to again. So when he thinks about the fact that like maybe this opens up into the gauntlet, I was like immediately sort of would it i thought it was it was like a a fake place but maybe it's real and if it were how wild would it be to have somebody show up who knows the gaunt what the gauntlet is and is able to warn everybody because now you've got a whole different like playing field now that people are aware of what they're getting into that sounds kind of fun you know just like beaten the game in a different way. It's like a speed run. Um, so he manages to like pull himself up to this light and look through and he sees a town. And uh, the whole, the, the way that this is described first, the cadmium yellow burn from above felt unnatural, felt wrong somehow. Yet grimacing against the glare, he slowly began to distinguish a slender glowing wire stretching across the sky. The space outside was vast. 
He took one final glance around the cave, set the bridge upon the ground, and swept black wind into the treasure's funnel. And he uses this bridge to get up there. This wire, it turns out, is a light source that seems to, like, go... I don't know if it's, like, around the entire planet, if it's just around Bastion and, like, like every city has its own light source, or, indeed, if planets work the same way here as anywhere else. But he calls it a sun wire. And uh, this, it turns out, has like a, there's a whole different way of telling time in this world, which I found really, really cool. Like, that's always a tricky thing when you're in fantasy is the ways to, for example, in Song of Ice and Fire, it'd be like, oh, the hour of the wolf, the hour of the owl. And that is how you explain what time it is. And it's very easy for that to like slide into sort of goofy territory where it just feels a little bit like you decided to just pick some cool words and put them together. And uh, I thought that the way it's described later was actually really neat and just a, a very original take. Um, So he's looking out and there's just a sense of like the fact that there's no ceiling or that he can see to the to place that he's looking almost makes him feel like he's going to fall over because he's been in enclosed space so long, which I definitely could see. Um, and it says the leftmost part of Bastion that abutted it was in ruins, ruins that had consumed a third of the city, ruins in whose periphery he now sat. In them, he saw the vast blocky remnants of scorched buildings, the streets between them having often collapsed into chasms whose depths glowed with fire or perhaps smoldering magma. Buildings whose sides had partially collapsed and spilled out into barren avenues or whose grandiose features were mostly erased by the passage of time and rough erosion. And later on, when he's talking to the two women that he meets, there's a real sense of like, there not being a straight answer to how this happened, which is really surprising. I was thinking that there was going to be some big disaster that everybody was able to point to. And it's like, there is a mention of a prophecy that failed, I think is the way they put it, but they don't directly blame the ruins on that exactly. So yeah, I, I'm, I have a lot of questions about that, but yeah, he looks out into this, uh, town and it's just like first of all how did this happen and you know the the place that the, there's just a sense of this this place like being full of people and activity and everything but there the fact that it directly abuts this wasteland is unnerving you know people living right here right up against it He's coming out of this, like, you know, tunnel system full of monsters right up against the edge of this hive of people. And it doesn't seem like things come up out of those tunnels to threaten the townsfolk too often. We don't really hear about that. And maybe I'm wrong. Um, so somehow this, like, works for them. And when he gets out, he is looking at some really cool architecture. Um, trees that have purple and blue leaves, monuments gilded in gold and silver and more detail than he could encompass. There was a huge ring set on the cylinder side so that from his vantage point, Scorio could see a great arena within while stadium seating descended from its high walls right down into the stands. Um, I feel like that place is probably going to wind up being something. So he has a just a kind of feeling of overwhelm for a second. And he thinks back to, <coughs> excuse me. Oh God. <laughs> he thinks back to Nyssa saying, how hard would it be to hide out? When, like if we got back to the world, who cares? What are we even going to do when we're up there? Which is a damn good question. Like, this is the sort of thing I think about a lot is like, what if something happened to me where I wound up in a place where I had no resources, my phone was dead, my shoes had been stolen, my wallet was stolen, and I have to find my way. And I, as a harmless looking 
almost 40 year old woman and probably not going to get the kind of problems that I could. But it's an interesting thought experiment. And this guy isn't even operating with the resources that I have where I would be trying to find some, like a phone so that I could call my husband and, you know, and I would also have my memories of who I am and where I am and what's going on. He's coming into this place as clueless as somebody starting a new game. Like, this is a world he doesn't know how it works. He doesn't know the the houses that are sort of running things. He doesn't even know what the money is called. Like, all of this is completely new to him. So he, like, there's a, a bunch of people out there and um, there's even a dude cooking meat and he's like it i'm getting teriyaki sauce from it because it's described as like sweet savory and this guy the way that it like makes scoria want to just run out there and beat this guy and take all that meat uh it was really giving like luffy from one piece but he makes himself wait Which that in itself is just such a huge exercise in discipline. Like just chilling and waiting until the light begins to change and people begin to go home. That is something it's like in Hunger Games when Katniss, she's thirsting to death and she finally finds water, but she fills up her little like jug and then puts an iodine tablet in and waits 20 minutes before she drinks the water so that it's safe. I would just die. I would drink that water without using my tablet because I was thirsty and then it would kill me and I would be dead. And that is how I would die. And it would be very embarrassing that I didn't have the the fucking discipline for 20 minutes of waiting, but I just wouldn't. I just know myself, you guys, and I would be dead. And that is why I am not like incredibly famous because I don't have that kind of drive to for the long view. Give me my immediate gratification, please, and thank you. So he's just sort of observing what's being sold and the fact that like clearly where this is isn't a wealthy area. Um, And there's a bunch of kids that are like playing with this weird uh, creature in a cage that like flares fire in response, like a defense mechanism. Um, and the light, he notices that the, the wire in the sky is dimmer than it had been. So clearly that's, what's like going to be changing over the course of the day. So eventually (laughs) the pair of musicians were the last to give up the market. They played even as the final stall owners left until the fiddler finally lowered her instrument with a frustrated grimace and gave a caustically mocking bow to the empty market. I did like that idea. That was well described. So he's looking at them like trying to figure out how likely is it that I get help from these ladies. And he watches them pack up and then he sees the way that they're heading is out into the ruins, which means they're not a part of this community. Because that's been a major thing for him is like, I'm an outsider. This is clearly a a neighborhood where everybody knows each other. If I just step out looking like I fucking look from where I have come from, that's going to cause a lot of issues. So I'm going to wait. And he needs to find somebody else who is an outsider. And these women are. So he approaches them on the street and I just loved how this went because um, it says he slipped out of the building and did his best to trail after them, trying to figure out the best approach. In the end, he decided to be direct. Anything else would rightfully cause them to regard him with suspicion. Thank you. Appreciate you because there are a lot of writers who would have him just try to follow them back to their like fireside and then approach them after they've like sat down and started to relax and have something to eat. And like, there's two of them and only one of him. So that's something. But as women in general, somebody you find out like they have followed you blocks and blocks to where you are staying. And that is going to make you kill them immediately. Like that's just, they would be completely justified. So him approaching them here. And understanding that if he does it in any other way, they're just going to be like, what the fuck? I appreciate him understanding that. 
Um, and as it is, you know, there's a, a sense of just like, what is it that you're going to do to us, though? And it takes a long time for him to win over either of them and convince them he is serious. Uh, and let's see, one of them is called Helena and the other is called Fan. And Helena is the one who's like a much more of a showgirl. And I say showgirl because I was going to say showman, but showman and showgirl mean distinctly different things. So I'm realizing that showgirl isn't the kind of uh, descriptor that I wanted because that's giving a whole different impl implication. So I think what I'm going to say is uh, the performer. Helena is the performer and Feyen is the backup. Feyen's stage management. Does that make sense? If you haven't worked in theaters at all, stage managers are like the people who just keep it running. They're the people who are clutch in terms of the lights going on the moment they're supposed to, mics working, scripts being correct. All of that is like absolutely necessary. But it is not like the front facing stuff that anyone notices. It's just taken for granted that all of that stuff happens and that somebody is taking care of it. And it, stage managers are like one of the most underappreciated professions, in my opinion. And Helena is the talent. She's the one on the stage smiling that everybody adores and knows her name. And everybody is just like coming to the theater for her and they are blissfully unaware that Feyen is keeping the lights on. Is that's that's the vibe I'm getting from the two of them and how they work together. Um, so yeah, Feyen is the one that's really like it's the hardest for her to be won over, and eventually Scorio does it, but he is. It's it's like he won her over only because he won Helena over, and Helena has such a force of personality that she can get Feyen to see things her way. And also there's the fact that he has this gem that's like really, really valuable, but they don't have anything that's like at all equal in value to give back. So they're, they're thinking this is a too good to be true deal. Who do you think you're dealing with? Like there's an understandable reaction of like somebody coming out of an alley and holding out a stack of a hundred dollar bills to me and being like, I just need a ride to such and such <laughs> the fuck you do. You know, like I would just immediately leave. Thank you. But no, but it turns out that they are in a kind of bad place and there's a conversation they have, which we don't get the words, but we do get the, the body language and it's clear that Helena is sort of throwing something in Feyen's face. Not not in a way that's like, I'm being spiteful, but in a, I, okay, fine, you're making me say it. Here's a thing that's true. You know it's true. I know it's true. We don't say it out loud, but we've gotten to a point where I'm going to say it out loud. And that's like the way this conversation seems to go between the two of them. So that finally, Feyen agrees to go along with this, but she is by no means like convinced that this is the right move. It's just sort of, she's got to take a bet here. And Helena is, I don't think she's like less wary of him. It's more that she has more confidence that they could take him and that her instincts are right because Feyen errs on being more suspicious of people. Um, Helena, I feel like is, she sort of seems to view I don't want to say, I was going to say she starts to see, sort of seems to view people as a joke. And I don't mean like as a joke, like you are not to be taken seriously so much as when she comes across a scenario, there's a curiosity about the way that she talks and responds to him. Whereas Feyen slams a door in your face, you know? So I don't want to say that Helena is like, she isn't by any means gullible. And I wouldn't even say that she's, she's more friendly, but not in a way that's like naive. It just feels like she has a more open mind about the potential of situations. Whereas Fayan approaches things, it seems as if the most likely outcome is bad every time. 
Like, let's just assume the worst right out of the gate. And Helen is like, but wait, let's wait and see. Let's try it. Let's give it a shot. You know, like, and I just, I relate to this a lot because I'm much more the Helena type in the way that I like move through the world. And my husband is much more the Fayan type as well as Rashawn is as well. And so it can be really hard because I'm out here just like, well, let's just, let's just see though. Like, you don't know that you're just deciding. And they're like, yeah, I'm deciding because it may be, and I'd rather just not risk it. And I'm always the one that's like, but what if we risked it though? What if we just like had some optimism about it? So I really enjoy their dynamic. I'm extremely interested in learning more about like the ongoing relationship between the two of them, because I can't tell at this point whether it's romantic or not. I don't get the sense the whole time, but there were a couple of moments where I was like, are, wait, are they a couple? And it's not overt. It's not necessarily important, like it may be, but at this moment, it isn't. I was just sort of curious about it. And we find out, too, that Fayan is like somebody who had a very different life once upon a time and kind of took a risk joining Helena in the way that she has and that shit's just not going the way that they could have hoped. It's harder, I think, than Fayan was prepared for. And I must say that if she's still in it after all of this, she must really, really care about Helena to stay in it. So anyway, eventually they come to a deal where he gets a meal, some robes and shoes and some information from them and lead him on the way to like finding a job. And he will give them this gem, which is just, they are making out like absolute bandits here. And he really doesn't have a choice. He has to do, it's the only thing of value he's got. Um, and then here it is. Why is a third of the city ruined? Nobody knows, said Helena. Why does a plant wither in time? Why does hot passion one day run cold? Bastion's dying. So it's a natural process, not part of the war? I didn't say that. But if you're going to ask these kinds of questions, we won't be of much help. We're just a pair of innocent troubadours and harvesters, a couple of talented ladies trying to get by. And harvesters, I was sort of like, is that a, is that a nice way of saying assassin? Like, it feels like it's a double entendre. Um, oh, Dan says totally the vibe about the, the stage manager and talent thing. Awesome. Uh, it's not as gay as Mage Aaron, but there's definitely representation in this series, which is nice. Dope. Um, so finally, he's asking about the houses here and how they work. Uh, one of them is House Hydra. That's the one that we start with. And she's thinking like, oh, is that the one you stole the gem from? Understandably, that's what they're assuming happened. Um, there are four great houses, with Hydra being the most prestigious, the most political of them. Kraken is the most prestigious, says said Fayin. No, it's not, said Helena, clicking her tongue in annoyance. It's the richest. Money doesn't equal prestige. Fayin didn't look convinced does in my books. And that's why I love your little mercenary soul, said Helena. So this, I really appreciated this distinction because money doesn't quite equal the same thing. And if you grew up like in the UK, I feel like this is something that you would understand even more deeply. It took me a while to get this as an American because I always assumed that like having money was so completely tied to class the way that it is here in the United States, that if you had a sort of noble heritage, like a, a big name, that if you didn't also have the money to go with that, it was essentially meaningless and you weren't really of nobility anymore. But I failed to understand the way that money has been turned into class in the United States in a way that was certainly like part of the deal. It was a major part of it in the UK, but there, the, the disdain for like new money makes it clear that sort of thing. It was much more about 
heritage and the descendants, like the whole way that this works is that it's handed down in a way that goes back so much farther than I can really grasp even in the, as somebody from the US. Not to say that we're not related to the U, but you know what I'm saying? Like there's a, just a, an immediacy there. So no, knowing that like one of them is the one that's got the, uh, the reputation for having the money. The other one's the reputation for like pride is kind of the vibe. And then there is um, Basilisk, which is the one that's like, the most underhanded, evidently. They they do some shady shit. And everybody kind of knows that. And they just, like, roll like that. And that's just part of the reputation. Which uh, I really am good with. So, yeah, we get this. He tries to explain about how he, like, lost his memories. And understandably, they're going, Ah, did you? Like, at first, a total lack of of faith in this. No belief whatsoever. But then there's the mention of great souls and the sort of changes the way that they're seeing this. Uh, he starts to ask if they are and realizes as he's saying it, like, that's a fucking stupid quote. They clearly aren't. But he says too much before he can stop himself. And Helena's like, do you think we're great souls? No, said Faya, tone deadpan. We're not. Are you? His exhaustion and hunger dulled his wits, so that for a moment he simply stared at her, trying to think of a convincing denial. This killed me, you guys. Just, like, the the awkwardness of that moment of him just staring at her. I'm just imagining, like, crickets as there's just, like, everything grinds to a halt. And finally, Helen just, let's not get personal, and just tries to cut it off, but... Later on, when he tries to deny that he's a, a great soul, he's like, the reaction Helena has is just, come on, dude, don't insult me after that. Like, uh, Jesus Christ. Um, so he makes the deal with them about finding work with Basilisk because he's ne he needs to earn some money somehow. He has fucking nothing. Uh, and there's an interesting, like, aside here. Um, why did we come here? Why did we build Bastion? Why did we leave Atera? I mean, that's the question of the hour, isn't it? We're all told from birth that it was to stop Hill from coming back to Atera. Now, is that true? Who can tell? But the fact is, the portal home's been closed for as long as anyone can remember. If it really even ever was a portal. You know what I think? Asked Fayan, dark eyes glittering. I think the Deniers are speaking a whole lot of sense. All of that's a story made up by the Great Souls to justify the way they treat us. Fayan. To justify the way they've set up Bastion, the order of things, the system of oppression that's kept us poor and servile. We've all these stories, but nobody knows if they're true. Even the Great Souls, even the leaders of the bloody houses, nobody knows there's no proof. I always loved this sort of thing. Like, whenever there's a story that's so old that... It's either just a myth. It's a myth that's like being made specifically for a purpose instead of just being stories that evolve. It's true. Or there's like a, an in-between of it. And there's no solid certainty of this kind of history. I just think that's a fun thing that you can, as a writer, throwing that in means that you can have a lot of fun with it later down the line and deciding like what you're going to make be true and what's going to happen in an exaggeration. Um, so Fayan agrees to use her contact to get in touch with Basilisk and get him a job. And uh, there's a, just a mention to him of like, if you're going to be working with them, you have got to keep a really low profile you are somebody who just like doesn't blend in and that's going to be, that's going to kind of work against you. So you're going to have to be careful about not only standing out as a person, but like the questions that you ask, the fact that you don't like, don't know anything, all of this, just be very cautious about the way that you approach stuff because they're, very secretive and they're going to feel like maybe you're after something otherwise. And that gets really solidified later on in the conversation that he has. Um, 
So, oh my God, I'm just realizing what time it is and I have not even gotten to the next. Oh my God. Okay. I'm going to hurry here. I'm going, I will hurry just to get through like what happens in the next chapter, but I am, I promise next episode, I will revisit it before I get started on the chapters that are assigned for that section. So Scorio falls asleep next to the fire and I love the fact that it's described as like, this is the most comfortable f- stone floor I've ever felt. But then when he wakes up, he's just like, Jesus, this is hard as a rock. This sucks. He starts eating soup. And uh, Helena says something about, it's pretty amazing what you can do with four day old dead rat. Scorio froze, then hopped his mouthful back into his bowl. And I was just like, no offense. Scorio, beggars can't be choosers. If it is four day old dead rat, and you couldn't tell when you took a bite because it was delicious, get over it and eat your fucking rat. Like, shut up. I just was very much like, just, you've got to move on from that, bud. Um, so the, the thing with the, like, being a great soul, it's really fun because Helena knows some things and it, he, when he asks, like, how do you know all this? Her response is essentially, what do you think we talk about all day? Like ordinary people who aren't part of that. It's mythical. Like all of us have been hoping that we would get called in. I even hoped it. So there's no sense of just like the common people shouldn't know this. Of course they should know this. You know, this is like, you know, it, 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 it they're celebrities. Of course people are going to be zeroed in on it and want to know all of the details. And it doesn't seem like all of it's, secret. She knows about the gauntlet, the igneous heart, all of the way that this is set up, not how they work. She can't give him advice on like igniting it, but she knows it exists and and that they get ignited. Like I just enjoy the way that she makes conversation. Um, You should just try to get back into the academy. Life for regular folks is hard. And he says, maybe I don't have a choice. And she's like, yeah, you got kicked out, huh? And he won't tell her and she like tells him, okay, fine, keep your secrets. But she can sense something's up. And uh, when she brings up like how everybody hates great souls, he's like, they're hated. And she says, yeah, because they're privileged. Of course, like that's the way that goes. Um, so eventually he hands over this gem and the uh, moment when I forgot about this, when Fayan comes back, Helena isn't there right away. And she immediately is just like, what did you do with her? But Scorio, she says, if she starts being nice to you, the Dola, the woman that I'm sending you to disappear. She's only nice to people. She's about to expend. And he's like, expend. And I'm like, yeah, dude, I feel like you should know what that means. I feel like that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, don't lie. Don't talk more than you have to. Don't do anything you're not told to. If she gives you a com- command, obey it to the letter. Um, so he changes into these like old sandals and robes, which are very much giving. You will get about a week's wear out of me before I fall apart. And then he goes to Dola at the double and he has to ask for directions on the street, which already he started to attract attention. Not only does he have to ask for directions for how to get there, but he has to stop and ask the directions of the compass from a child on the street. Now, I personally would also have to do this just in New York on earth, because I don't know the points of a compass instinctually, but they seem to think it is absolutely fucking bonkers that he doesn't know them. So that he just keeps drawing attention. And the way he's asking the questions, like there's such easy, obvious questions. The kid thinks he's fucking with him and eventually says that his mother is like, uh, what does she, what does he call her? Oh God, I'm going to have to find it. Um, oh my God, I'm so over time. You guys, I just, I wanted to talk about the, the light with the, the sun wire 
Clay is the darkest. Second clay is the last. It goes from clay to rust to bronze to amber, which is the middle of the light cycle. I think that's so cool. I just think that's a really neat system. Um, but, oh, <laughs> here it is. Uh, your mother is a drippy tramp. That's it. I was I was thinking wet, and then I was like, drippy tramp. Oh my God. That is very evocative. That's a good one. So Scorio eventually gets circled by some, some thugs. And you guys, this was everything for me. I loved this so much. And I, I am going to wait and talk about Dola next time, I think, because I am so over time because I have to give this fight like some attention I have I have had some times when I lived in Philly coming home from work and being the most angry I've ever been like that. I worked a job in Philly that was infuriating and I would have to walk through a pretty bad neighborhood to get to my house. And there were some days where I walked home and I wanted somebody to start something. I genuinely wanted somebody to fuck with me because I was so ready to throw fists at anybody. Even if they had like pulled a knife, I would not have cared. I would have fucking done it because I have a very bad temper sometimes. And it's part of the reason why I didn't want to have kids. It's just like, I can't bear the idea of losing my temper with a child. Like it's just too awful. And the fact that these people circle him and his immediate response is like, yes, yes. Oh my God, I wanted to fight so bad. Like, what the fuck? I totally get it. But also, that's not a one-on-one. -on -one, that's, a, that's a circle of people around you. This man is a bad, bad man. I like Iscorio in a lot of ways. But then you, you come out with this sort of reaction and I'm just like, oh God, that's not a good sign. And I want him to like ask himself more about his reactions to things, but he also doesn't have a lot of time to spare to be navel gazy, you know, in this moment. So, but yeah, this dude tries to like, the leader is like, just give us your stuff and there won't be any trouble. And Scorio's like, God, I don't remember what I even have on me. Maybe you should come and check. And when the dude's like, we don't have to do it that way. Scorio says, your mother's a drippy tramp. And he says, the thing the kid said to him. <laughs> I love, this got me so bad, you guys, using the exact same insult that he just heard a second ago. Because like, what insults does he even know? Because he doesn't remember anything. I just love the fact that it's like the kids saying it put the phrase into his inventory. And then he just went and got it out. I was like, this will be great. I'll use this right now. Which is honestly kind of the way I am with like phrasing. So fair. But yeah, he absolutely obliterates these guys. They're not dead, but they're like in really bad shape between using the bar and using the chalk. Everybody is like, what the fuck? Because clearly he's using magic, which is already you're out of your league and you started some shit that you didn't want to be starting. And then he mentions, I'm going to tell Dola who held me up. So what's your name? And all of them are like, you're meeting Dola. Well, what? I, I didn't know that. Like, just don't worry about it. We don't, we don't need to know each other's names. It's fine. And Scoria just says, right. You are. And leaves. You guys, that was so funny to me. Like, it's not even necessarily that he works for Dola. He's meeting Dola. So this dude doesn't necessarily know Dola, but this guy takes a meeting with Dola. And the way that Scorio says it as, you're one of her guys. And that was a really smart move. Well done, Scorio. Points to you on that. So, okay, next episode, I'm going to talk about Dola off the top. I really, really liked her character. So I want to give her the time that she deserves. And also, I want to give yet another, like, almost fight the time that it deserves. 
So appreciate you, Dan, for your patience. Um, but I'm really enjoying this one. I like it a lot. And I'm, I'm looking forward to reading more. All right, folks, until next time, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.